Good evening, everyone, and welcome at our uh, webinar about bioinks entitled Bioinks, a Prelude to Tomorrow's Medicine by Dr. Jasper van Hoorik. These webinars are organized by the KVCV or the Royal Flemish Chemical Society, of which I'm going to give you now a short introduction. The KVCV is a chemical society within Flanders, so for the Dutch speaking, the northern part of Belgium. And we are a community of chemists in Flanders and far beyond because everyone can become a member of our society. And our members mainly are students, PhD students, academics, teachers, and professionals. So we really, we really do represent and strive to support everyone within the chemical education, the industry, and the society. We mainly organize lectures about popular scientific topics for the general audience or more domain-specific workshops. Afterwards, we typically have a networking reception but unfortunately in the online editions, that is not possible. Here we have an overview of our upcoming events. More information or registration is possible via kvcv.be slash calendar. Since the summer break is near, we are a bit less active, but after the summer break, we will have some more events for you. Mense Molecula is our magazine, which is distributed to all our members each month. So this means we have 12 editions a year. And in this magazine, you can find news about the chemical industry, about academics, but also about our own activities or scientific advancements and much more. If you're a member of KVCV, you're automatically also a member of UCAMS, the European Chemical Society. And as a member of UCAMS, you have discount at various activities endorsed or organized by UCAMS. If you are a member of KVCV, you also have reduced prices at our activities. You receive, as already mentioned, our magazine, Mens and Molecule, but you're also part of the chemistry community within Flanders. And this will help you to extend your knowledge and broaden your network. If you are interested in a membership, you can always visit our website, kvcv.be slash membership. And for a PhD student, for example, it's only 12 euros a year. So let's stay in touch. All information can be found on our website, kvcv.be, but we can also be reached via our social media channels. We have a Facebook account. We also have a YouTube channel on which you can rewatch all our webinars again. And we also have a LinkedIn page. Our series of webinars is supported by Chemistry Europe. So have a look at their journals as they might be of interest for your next publication. We are now about to start with our webinar. If you have any questions during the lecture, please don't hesitate to uh, type them into the uh, Q&A section of the Zoom platform. So please don't put them in the chat, but do put them in the Q&A section. Then it's easier for us to find your questions and then we will ask them to the speaker. And then let me now introduce you to the speaker of today, Jasper van Horik. Jasper obtained his master's degree in chemistry in 2014 with a thesis on tissue engineering for which he was awarded an Agoria Award. In 2015, he started a PhD in the Polymer Chemistry and Biomaterials Group with a grant obtained from the Research Foundation Flanders, or the FWO. This project, a joint project between Ghent University and the Vrije Universiteit Brussel, focused on the development of biodegradable polymer materials for ocular tissue regeneration. In this research, he focused on the development and processing of materials using multi-photon lithography. His research resulted so far in 20 Web of Science collection papers, one book chapter, and two patents. In 2019, he graduated as a PhD with summa cum laude with felicitations of the jury. And in 2020, his doctoral research was crowned with a Solvay Award. Currently, Jasper is leading the spin-off project Expectings, which focuses on the commercialization of innovative materials and bioinks for 3D bioprinting uh, fabrication. So now we give now the word to Jasper to take us on a journey in the bioprinting world. So Jasper, I would say the screen is yours. Thank you, Nathan. Okay, I will share my screen. Um, should have worked now. Okay, um, can everybody hear me and, and see my screen? Yeah, perfect. Okay, then I will... Uh, Start my lecture. So, good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the introduction, Nathan. Indeed, I am uh, Jasper van Horik, and I will talk to you about uh, bioinks and their potential for uh, tomorrow's medicine. 
And I would like to do that by starting with a little mind exercise. So imagine the summer when all this COVID mess has cleared a bit, you go on a road trip with some friends and you're having a great time until disaster strikes. You crash the car and your friends get wounded. This is a horrible, horrible idea, but a great example to prove a specific point. So let's have a look at this example from two uh, points of view. So let's have a look at what happened from the point of view of the car and from the point of view of the passengers. So the car is crashed. So what can you do now? So the lightly damaged parts you can repair very easily, um, respray them or whatever, so that it doesn't show that they have been damaged before. And the badly damaged parts you can just replace with new ones exactly the same way as they came out of the factory in the first place and as they were on the car before. Now, for the humans in there or, or your friends, it's more tricky. So what can happen there if you have light injuries? They will heal by themselves, but they will probably leave behind scar tissue. If you have more heavier injuries, it becomes more tricky. Either they can be, uh, an attempt can be made to repair them via surgery, or worst case scenario, you have to look to repair the damaged tissue. Um, unfortunately, there is not a sufficient supply of donor tissue available. So in the worst case scenario, you will not be able to get a donor tissue or you end up on a waiting list or even worse, not all tissues are able to be transplanted. You need to have something amputated or, uh, or even lose your life in general. So what is the outcome of this mind exercise? Um, the car looks brand new again and is ready to, to go on, on many more road trips, but the peoples are injured and probably will suffer. If they survive, they will suffer permanent damages to the body. So what if we could apply the situation of the car also to the passengers and the humans and restore them back factory fresh and after any issue you may encounter. Now, this is what the field of regenerative medicine is focusing on. So instead of trying to replace damaged tissue with donor tissue, this field is focusing to regenerate damaged tissue with body-owned cells. Now, this is an interesting concept, uh, don't you agree? Um, I also think this is very interesting, and this is actually the inspiration why I started my PhD many, many years ago, where I was, as Nathan mentioned, focusing on the regeneration of ocular tissue, or more um, specifically development of materials for the regeneration of ocular tissue. It was, it was a very interesting research project, which I enjoyed a lot. And at the end, after a few years, I managed to obtain my degree, for which I was very happy. But of course, then the question arose, what now? Because although we got some promising results in the PhD, the, the technology was still nowhere near to bringing it to the patient. So is this then the end of this research? Unfortunately, in many cases, this is the case. After PhD projects um, finish, often the, the research also isn't continued. And this is a very sad fact because there's many promising research ongoing in, in academia, which never really makes it to the real world. And this is what we call the valley of death. So together with some other uh, colleagues, some other PhD students, we started to think, um, can we not do something with our, our, our experience and our know-how and our technology, which we developed? So we started thinking, during our PhDs, we had a lot of material-based collaborations uh, with many international uh, scientists uh, who were using our materials to perform their magic on it, so to, to perform their application-based uh, research. So then the idea rose, can we not make a business out of this? But of course, an idea is fine, but where do you start? So we started looking at for what applications our materials have been used so there were um, people focusing on more fundamental research, fundamental tissue engineering, understanding interactions of uh, cells and materials. People focusing on more applied topics, such as topics in regenerative medicine or uh, in the field of drug screening. So we started to look what do these three fields have in common. And what they had in common was actually the use of biofabrication, which is basically 
the use of 3D printing for uh, tissue engineering applications. So with this in mind, what if we could transfer our material expertise into ready to use bio inks or become research partners um, in people's projects so that we can also provide them with the right tools to not only bridge the value of that for our research by bringing our materials to the commercial stage, but also helping other people further down the line, which are focusing on the applied research to bring their, uh, to, co to bridge the value of that in their research by offering reliable reproducible bio inks uh, to them. And this is how the idea of expecting started. And so this brings me to the topic of today, which is biofabrication or bio inks. So biofabrication, as I mentioned, is basically the use of 3D printing for tissue engineering and, and cell culture applications. And what do you need for that is three main components. Of course, you need to have your cells, which are your building blocks of your tissue you want to develop. You need to have a computer assisted design, to of course, know how to deposit the cells in the right way. And of course, you need to make your cells bioprintable, 3D printable. And for that, you're going to use bio inks, which not only make the cells processable, but also ensure high viability after 3D printing so that you can put the constructs into culture. And after you reach sufficient tissue maturation, you can use this for a whole range of applications. But a long term uh, application, the dream of all researchers in biofabrication is that one day we can use this technology to regenerate or, or replace damaged tissue, bone and organs with patients own cells. But there's still a long way ahead towards that. But where there is a lot of near future potential is in the field of drug screening, personalized drug screening, and to replace animal testing, both in drug screening and as cosmetic screening. Now, why is this so interesting? Because a few years ago, the European Union decided to have a ban on um, animal testing for cosmetics. So there is a great pull from the industry towards alternatives. And one concept which is very interesting there is organ on chip models, which is a multi-channel 3D microfluidic cell culture chip that simulates the activities, mechanics, and physiological response of entire organs and organ systems or a type of artificial organs. In other words, what you basically want to do is generate a very, very small 3D uh, piece of tissue on a microfluidic chip, which is representative for the function um, uh, of, of the, the tissue in the native environment. And by doing that, you have a very easy system which allows complicated tissue monitoring uh, on a straightforward matter with, with microscopy or, or spectroscopy. You can um, study drug tissue interactions in depth immediately on the tissue of interest uh, and even on human tissue. So with that, you can reduce animal trials, but not only reduce them, you can replace them by a more representative system. So you can use human cells, meaning that you don't have issues related to uh, interspecies differences, which often make uh, animal tests useless in the long run. And by doing that, you can increase the drug and the cosmetic screening efficiency and significantly decrease the drug screening costs. Now, since you can use this for to replace animal testing for cosmetics, of course, this also clears the road for drug screening and more specifically personalized drug screening. You could, for example, take a biopsy of cancer cells, 3D print them in a, in a, a functional tissue and look what the most efficient uh, chemotherapeutic therapy is to uh, treat the patient. So this is a bit the concept of biofabrication and the application potential. But let us focus now on the main topic uh, of this lecture, which is the field of bioinks. Now, what exactly is a bioink? A bioink is a mixture of polymers, crosslinkers, additives, rheological modifiers, and or solvents which allow 3D printing of tissues. So it's a complicated mixture, and I have to um, make a little sidestep here uh, to briefly explain the agreed terminology by the International Society of Biofabrication, where there is a clear distinction between a bioink and a biomaterial ink. So we can only uh, reference to a material as a bio ink if there are cells in there. If there are no cells in there and you first print the structure without cells and seed them afterwards, 
you have a biomaterial ink. Of course, adding cells to biomaterial ink can immediately transfer it to bioink. So now that we know the concept of what a bioink is or a biomaterial ink actually is, let us look what are the requirements of the ideal um, bioink or biomaterial ink. So first of all, we need to have a matrix which can mimic the natural extracellular environment or the extracellular matrix. So this is one thing where bio, uh, bioinks need to comply to. But the second thing is, of course, they need to be processable using 3D printing technologies. And there are many different 3D printing technologies which all have their specific requirements. So let us now have a closer look at what the extracellular matrix looks like. So this is a highly hydrated network uh, composed mainly out of proteins and polysaccharides. Um, mainly, these proteins are mainly composed of collagen, which is a cell interactive environment and allows remodeling, meaning that cells can degrade and resynthesize the extracellular matrix on their own. And then when we look at the additive manufacturing properties, we need to have materials which are sufficient, which have sufficient mechanical pro properties, which are robust enough to maintain their shape after printing. Now there's a lot of specific properties related to the specific printing technology, but what is key is that it should allow for easy processing. And in most of the technologies, photocurability is a plus. So let's convert all these uh, properties to measurable properties for, for our bioinks. So we came up with a list where we want to have a bioink needs to be biocompatible, uh, of course, because we want to use it in the presence of cells and in the body. We want it to be a hydrogel, being a polymer which can absorb large amounts of water without dissolving uh, to represent the, the natural environment. It needs to be cell interactive to allow for cell migration and cell proliferation. Of course, it needs to be physiologically stable, meaning that when you put it in cell culture, your bioink cannot just uh, wash away. But on the other hand, it's also preferably biodegradable so that when your cells, when your tissue is maturing, it can gradually degrade the bioink and replace it for their own natural extracellular matrix so that over time your body doesn't even uh, notice that there ever has been a foreign material in there. And then looking for the uh, additive manufacturing properties, of course, needs to be easy processable, photocurable, and robust material. So where do we start to come up with a bioink? Well, as often is the case in science, a good starting point is just looking at, the na at nature. So when we look at the natural materials uh, present in the extracellular matrix, we can have a look at collagen, which is the main component, and the polysaccharides like hyaluronic acid. I also included gelatin here because this is basically hydrolyzed collagen, which has a lot of the similar properties uh, combined with easier uh, processing. So when we look at these materials, we see that from the biological point of view, in mimicking the extracellular matrix, they are very good, which is not a, uh, no surprise as they are the main components of the uh, extracellular matrix. But from an additive manufacturing perspective, they are really underperforming. So what can we do about that? Well, we can look at other similar materials in nature, like for example, alginate, which is a very popular material, which is also a polysaccharide, very similar to hyaluronic acid but uh, which has a benefit that it can be easily processed uh, when cross-linking it, cross it uh, by ionic cross-linking. But the downside is it's not so interactive and not biodegradable. So still not have the ideal material. Maybe we need to look at the synthetic uh, hydrophilic polymers. So what about polyethylene glycol or polyvinyl alcohol? Now, these materials are hydrophilic polymers, but they're not hydrogels. They will dissolve in water. So that's an ideal benefit is they are biocompatible. And in the case of PVA, for example, it allows easy processable and is very robust, but it doesn't comply with the other requirements. So we're still not there. So maybe we can look at it from the other side, look at it from the 3D printing perspective. So what are very popular biocompatible materials in the field of 3D printing? These are aliphatic polyesters like polylactic acid and polycaprolactone. And these materials perform very well um, from a processing point of view, and they are biocompatible and biodegradable and, by, and uh, stable at physiological conditions. However, they are not hydrogels, but thermoplasts and not cell interactive, so they're still not ideal. So is there a way that we can 
change these materials, modify them chemically to make them more compliant to our needs? Of course there is. And a very um, commonly applied strategy is the introduction of cross-linkable or photo cross-linkable groups, which are very often acrylates or metacrylates, but can also be more innovative chemi uh, chemistries like thiolene chemistry, click chemistry, uh, redox systems. But I will focus now on the most commonly applied uh, modifications being uh, acrylation or metacrylation. Because the benefit is that these biopolymers have a lot of uh, reactive functionalities like amines or hydroxyls or, or carboxylic acids, which can easily be, be coupled to uh, functional chemicals. And by doing that, you can introduce these cross-linkable groups on your polymer networks, which after irradiation or, or a specific process can polymerize, resulting in an insoluble network and therefore increasing stability and uh, processability. So let us have a look what this does with the properties of these materials. So when we metacrylate or acrylate these materials, we see that certain aspects change. So first of all, the materials become photocurable, which is beneficial for a lot of uh, uh, 3D printing applications. Um, they become physiologically stable. Uh, the materials are hydrogels. They become hydrogel networks, the, the hydrophilic polymers. But of course, we can still see that while the materials are all performing already uh, a lot better, there's still no material which has all the required properties. And this leads one to think, is it actually possible to have a material or, or a formulation which has that? Well, it turns out that this is quite tricky. And this is, brings us to what is referred to as the biofabrication paradox. So typically, for a biological perspective, you want to have a very loose hydrophilic polymer network. This will keep the cells happy. They will uh, very easily migrate, uh, degrade it and resubstitute it for their own extracellular matrix. But of course, this is very difficult or even impossible to process in, into a, a specific shape. On the other hand, if you want to have a material which is very processable, so has very good shape, shape fidelity, you want to have a very stiff material, a very densely crossing material, which is where the conventional 3D printing techniques are. However, uh, these very uh, stiff networks are not really suitable for um, cell, uh, cell encapsulation. So this uh, has forced researchers to compromise in what is referred to as a traditional biofabrication window meaning that you end up with materials which are suboptimal from a processing perspective, and suboptimal from a biological perspective, but sort of work. But of course, research never stops uh, at suboptimal levels. There's always uh, the need to go further to novel strategies. But first, I would like to focus on these conventional fabrication strategies. It's not necessarily uh, if you have a material which is very good, uh, from a 3D printing perspective and is biocompatible, this can be a good basis for a biomaterial link or to serve as a supporting combination with a bioink to provide um, structural support uh, during printing. And this actually brings me to the novel strategies. So there are many different strategies um, focusing on improving the printability while maintaining uh, biocompatibility, which can, for example, be combination of a soft material with a very hard material. And there's three levels where you can tune the material properties in this field. So first of all, you have the polymer level where your base polymer uh, or your main component of, of, of your bioink will determine the large part of your physical chemical properties, mechanical properties and, and biodegradability, stability, these types of things. So you can, make adaptations there, as I already introduced, like for example, making them uh, photo cross linkable, but there's always limitations how far you can go. And the next level is on the formulation level, the actual bioink or biomaterial ink level. So you can add a cross linker, different photo initiator, uh, put the radiological modifiers, growth factors. There's many different options there, uh, which is basically uh, referred to as adding a little bit of pepper and the salt to your formulation to, to, to tailor it to the needs. And then uh, another strategy is, of course, focusing on the processing technology. So by innovative processing, 
make materials processable which are not uh, previously processable. And as I mentioned in the introduction, there are many different 3D printing or biofabrication technologies. And here I've classified the three main uh, types. So you have the most conventional deposition-based 3D printing, which is the lowest resolution uh, 3D printing, but also the most popular one. Then you have the light-based techniques where you have more conventional uh, UV-based processing techniques up into the very high resolution laser-based multi-photolithography. Um, printing technologies. So let us start with the deposition-based technologies. Now, deposition-based technologies are relying on the deposition of a material, a bioink or a biomaterial, through a nozzle onto a print bed. And by moving this nozzle around in the XY dimension, you can get a, a first layer, um, basically uh, following the, the shape that you want. Once this layer is finished, you can deposit the next layer on top of it and keep on doing that until you get a full uh, 3D structure. Now, as you can imagine, you need to have material which flows very nicely. So the properties of a bioink in this field are mainly related to the viscosity and the rheology, rheology. So let us look what the ideal material looks like. So first of all, we want to have a material which flows very easily through the nozzle so that we can um, print it with low shear forces as this um, uh, as, as high shear forces are, are not good for, for cell survival. But secondly, while we want to have a material with very low viscosity during extrusion, we also want to have make sure that the material remains its shape after deposition. And of course, it needs to be cell compatible. So what we are looking for is a material which behaves like this. So after it comes out of the nozzle, it maintains a shape which is uh, put by the nozzle, so it maintains a, the 2D drawing. But fortunately, most polymer solutions behave like this, so just a liquid, which makes it very difficult or even impossible to uh, get any control over, over the structure. So what is the solution here? You can add rheological modifiers to end up with a material which is what we call shear thinning, meaning that in rest, you have a very high viscosity, so the material will not move. It's uh, sort of a gel. But once you ex exert an external force, viscosity will decrease uh, very uh, rapidly, resulting in a very uh, fluid material, which can easily be extruded. But once you remove the external pressure, the viscosity is regained, and you get a, a, a good shape retention because you get a very viscous material. So what this basically means is that you have material which behaves like this. And you can compare it a little bit to your, to your hair gel at home. Once it's in the pot, it's very uh, solid or gel-like. But when you move around, it becomes liquid. And when you untouch it, it's solid again, or gel. And by tailoring your rheological modifiers, which you can add to your solution, you can make an unprintable uh, material or an unprintable formulation very printable. So you get a very nice reproduction of the applied uh, computer assisted design. Now this um, has been used as well by researchers, for example, uh, by uh, researchers from Utrecht in the group of, of Scholz Malda, who have blended gel and gum as a, as a rheological modifier into a gelatin based, so a gelatin metacrylate based uh, bioing. And this allowed to improve the, um, the processability significantly. So when we look at the conventional processing window, we see that we need relative high gelatin concentrations. And when the gelatin concentration goes too high, up to 20 weight, 20%, when the best shape retention is observed, cell encapsulation is not possible. Um, however, when it goes too low, you cannot get proper structures out of it. But they saw by blending in uh, low amounts of, of gel and gum of rheological modifiers, they could bring the solution, the concentration down to 3%, I still get very nice structures, meaning that they have a very loose network, which is very good from a processing, uh, from a biological uh, point of view, but also very good from a processing point of view, as you can see here. So this is one strategy. The second strategy to improve the processability of hydrogels is a strategy which we developed, where we have a patented technology allowing uh, UV cross-linking of hydrogels in the solid state 
meaning that we can print our hydrogels as thermoplasts, thereby taking advantage of uh, conventional 3D printing methods, conventional thermoplastic based 3D printing methods, allowing for nice shape retention after printing. You can cross-link it, put it in water, and we get a nice hydrogel. Now these are examples of, of tuning the properties from a formulation point of view. But then finally, there's also methods to um, tailor it from a processing perspective. So you can play around with the chemical cross-linking during printing. You can play around with the temperature during printing so that you have more or less physical interactions in your materials. You can have, play around with your rheology, for example, by having dynamic covalent networks, which are materials, which are chemical bonds, which can rupture on the shear, also resulting in, in shear thinning behavior. Uh, blend in complementary chemicals, which result in solidification of the material only after excluding, extrusion, only after mixing, or use innovative uh, technologies such as support paths to generate complicated geometries. So this is the theory. Let us go to a little bit of examples. So when you talk about biofabrication, a specific material always comes to mind, which is gelatin and more specifically gelatin with acrylamide. It was developed around 20 years ago at uh, Ghent University in, in our research group um, and is obtained via the modification of the primary amines in gelatin with metacrylic anhydride to result in photocross linkable metacrylamides. Now, gelatin has gained a lot of popularity because on the one hand it is um, derived from the natural extracellular matrix derived from collagen. On the other hand, if you think about gelatin from the kitchen, it has an interesting behavior, meaning that at low temperatures, it's a gel. When you heat it, it becomes liquid. So you can somehow play around with this transition to make it processable via 3D printing. Of course, you want to have your shape uh, retention after printing, so therefore, you will cross-link the material via UV irradiation to lock this gel state. So by relying on this perspective, Many researchers have used this material for a whole range of applications, including, for example, uh, adipose tissue regeneration, where you can see that with a lot of fine tuning, you get quite nice structures, um, which can be seeded with cells, uh, which can be differentiated in adipose tissue. But the downside is, here is, although these structures look quite nice, that there's a very narrow processing window. It's very dependent on the temperature of the nozzle, of the environment, the humidity. So reproducibility is quite tricky. So therefore, you can play around with innovative processing technologies. So as I mentioned, in the most uh, applications, or most processing technologies, you first 3D print your structure, and then you irradiate it after the position. However, this not only always leads to satisfactory results, because if your viscosity is too low, you will not have a very nice shape retention. Other strategies, first pre-crossing the material slightly to increase the viscosity so that you can also 3D print uh, it. But what you're doing there is basically rupturing uh, a gel. So you don't really get very good shape retention and your, um, you will have very poor interlayer adhesion. So what the people in the research group of Jason Burdick came up with is in situ cross-linking, where you irradiate your sample, you cross-link it inside your needle during printing, thereby significantly increasing the viscosity here, allowing for a very straightforward deposition. And by doing that, they managed to print low concentration of gelatin with acrylamide. Uh, here is an example of five weight percent uh, gelma, which is printed in the shape of a nose with a very nice shape fidelity. Um, so this significantly increases printability while having this uh, very loose network. I would like to make a side note here that in research papers, you often come across images of printed noses or ears or hearts, but while they look like the actual tissue and they often have cells in there, they're still far from functional, but we are gradually getting there. And then another strategy is the use of fresh printing, which is use of a support bot. So basically what you do, is you have a bath of a material, which can be, for example, gelatin granules, um, in which you directly print your complicated shape. And these uh, granules will provide support to your material 
during printing and after the solution, you get your complicated structures. Now this can be used to generate uh, a lot of complicated tissues, a lot of complicated structures uh, at um, very low concentration gels, which can be um, irradiated afterwards before the uh, support part is dissolved to end up with this very nice complicated structures at low concentrations. So these are some examples of innovative um, uh, 3D printing technologies. But of course, uh, we also, with Expectings, have uh, come up with a, a portfolio of, of some materials um, which, which allow 3D printing in a very straightforward manner. So first of all, uh, we have our X-Gel mines, which we had to have in there because, as I mentioned, it is uh, one of the gold standards in the field and was actually developed 20 years ago, ago by our current business developer, Anne van der Bulke, and has been proven suitable for a lot of applications. Now, as I mentioned, this is processable, but the, the processing window is quite narrow. So therefore, we also developed our next generation gelatin-based ink, which we call our X-Easy gel, which has all the benefits from a biological perspective as a conventional gel ma, with shear thinning behavior, meaning that you can print it very easily at 37 degrees, which is uh, reflected in these videos. So on the left, you can see gel ma at 37 degrees, which is way too liquid. Um, meaning that you never can get nice shape retention. When we have our shear thinning easy gel, you see that a nice filament is extruded, making it very straightforward to 3D print with this material, which is shown in this picture, where you can see that you have very nice shape retention. So the material immediately has uh, increased viscosity after printing, making this a very uh, interesting material for biofabrication. We also have other shear thinning materials, including our X-Tablings, which is a non-biodegradable uh, synthetic hydrogel, uh, which is very robust, so ideal for, um, for load-bearing applications like uh, bone or cartilage. Then we have our uh, X-Hydromeltings, which is our thermoplastic um, hydrogel, which I mentioned before, which also forms a very robust hydrogel, and it's ideal as a biomaterial ink to be combined with another um, ink in printing to overcome some of the limitations related to the mechanical properties. And then finally, we also have a polyester-based material, uh, which is photocross linkable and very robust, which again can be used for uh, load-bearing applications. Now, this brings me to another, another 3D printing technology, um, and actually my, my personal favorite technology, which is uh, multi-photon lithography, where I worked a lot on uh, during my, my PhD research. And I will immediately tell you why this uh, technology is so interesting. It's the highest resolution 3D printing technology uh, to date. And it's based on the use of a near infrared laser on the absorption of multiple photons. So what you basically do in a conventional UV based cross-linking uh, process, you irradiate your sample, your photo initiator, which will go to the excited state. And when it drops down, it will initiate the polymerization. Now into photon polymerization, you use instead of a UV light source, you use a near infrared source. So half the wavelength means it has, each photon has half the energy. So you can only have polymerization if you sufficient, if, if you can have simultaneous absorption of two photons, which each have uh, half of the required energy. And the only way you can achieve that is by having a very powerful laser which is uh, very tightly focused. So this means that in a very small volume pixel or voxel, you will have so many photons present that there is a chance that two photons will collide at the same time with the uh, photo initiator molecule, resulting in only polymerization in this very small uh, volume pixel. Whereas in conventional UV uh, induced polymerization, you would have polymerization all uh, around your beam path. Now this all sounds pretty theoretical, but I think uh, it's always easier to show it with a movie. So here you see the printing of a castle on, a, on the tip of a pencil. So very, very small uh, feature. So I think it's about 300 micrometers wide, which is done in, uh, at the uh, Technical University of Vienna in the research group of uh, uh, Alexander of Sianikov, which we with whom we have been working uh, a lot also during my PhD. And you can see here that the, this voxel is scanned in a layer by layer fashion um, 
very rapidly, so you see it as lines, but basically it's, it's one voxel which is scanned, even reproducing the finest details of this castle. So if you take into account that this is about 300 micrometers, these towers are maybe only 10 micrometers wide. So you can see that you uh, have a real sub nanometer resolution with this, which you will immediately also see in the SEM images. So can you imagine that you have subcellular resolution? How cool would this be to use this for biofabrication? Because then you can uh, really give cues to your cells on how to grow and have really tiny tissues. But of course, for a material to be processable, it has some specific requirements. First of all, it needs to be two photo, uh, photo cross linkable, um, which is not the case for many materials. Well, it, the, the, you, can, you can easily make uh, two photo, photo cross linkable bio ink by having multiple components in there. What's also very important is that you have fast cross linking because since you have such a high resolution, if you want to print a larger structure, you want to do this as fast as possible. Uh, so you want to have very reactive materials, which are cell compatible. And a benefit can also be if they're in the solid state or the gel, because then when you are cross-linking uh, your structure, it is supported by your non cross link material, which can be washed out afterwards. So during my PhD, I did a lot of research on uh, gelatin-based formulations for to photon polymerization, where first of all, we could show that we could significantly increase the obtainable resolution of gelatin-based hydrogels in comparison to the conventionally used uh, gel map. But of course, you can argue here that while we have high resolution, this is not really a 3D structure, but more a two, two and a half D. And I would agree. So therefore, uh, the tricky part is if you could have a self-supporting uh, complicated structure, like for example, our national monument, the Atomium. So the interesting thing on the Atomium is you have very small feature sizes, which are supporting a large, 3D structure. And we can see that we could reproduce this in a gelatin-based uh, bio-ink formulation or biomaterial ink formulation, as there are no cells in there. And this is all very cool from a, an aesthetic point of view, but of course, we also want to use it for biofabrication applications. So we could also make micro scaffolds using these technologies, which we could seed with cells, where we see that after seven days of culture, the cells fully populated migrate onto and into the structure and take over the morphology. And this is very nice, but still a little bit basic. Cell CD is, is, is not that spectacular uh, anymore. Uh, so therefore, my colleague uh, Agi uh, managed to also develop a bio ink suitable for cell encapsulation with high resolution. So here we see encapsulated cells, which uh, fully take over uh, the, the structure after, after cell culture, we can even see after five weeks that they start to degrade and resubstitute the, the uh, bio-ink um, with their own extracellular matrix. So this is all very interesting, but still quite fundamental. But coming back to this resolution, which is incredible, um, this can be actually the ideal technology for the development of, of organ on chip applications where you want to have a tiny structure representative for the actual um, tissue. So together with my colleague Aggie, we exploited this, uh, where we came up, for example, with the uh, placental barrier model, where we have a placental barrier in a microfluidic chip, where on the one hand, on the one side, we have uh, mother cells, and on the other side, we have fetal cells, which is the ideal um, um, platform to test if drugs can go through the placental barrier and see what their influence is. Another uh, project which was performed was uh, use this technology for cancer drug screening. So this comes close to this personalized medicine which I was talking about before. So what we see here is a spheroid of, of, of osteosarcoma, tumor cells inside an environment of um, healthy cells in a 3D environment. And we could selectively irradiate the tumor cells so we can see that we can remove the tumor cells and leave the environment uh, healthy, the surrounding environment healthy. And then another application, since we have this high resolution, which is unique for this technology, this is the only biofabrication technology enabling the reproduce, re, uh, reproduction of a microvascular network. 
So she managed to 3D print a microvascular network with, with uh, blood vessels going down to 10 micrometers, which were completely interconnected and perfusible, and even managed to line them with endothelial cells while being embedded into a matrix of other cells. Now, as a proof of concept of this technology, she could also make complicated uh, intertwined spiral networks where she could seed one cell type on one hand of the chip, which would migrate uh, one of the spirals and is stained in red, and another cell type on the other one, showing that you can really guide cellular behavior with this technology. Now, of course, since I'm very enthusiastic about this technology, we also had to have a resin of this in our portfolio. And I'm very happy that uh, last month we launched together with Nano, an Austrian um, two photon polymerization manufacturer. We launched, launched the first um, bioink enabling cell encapsulation at the micro scale thereby benefiting from conventional gelma-based bioinks and the high resolution um, processability of, of conventional uh, resins, which also has been shown uh, suitable for a whole range of different tissues. Now this brings me to the final technology, so the conventional light-based technologies where digital light projection or digital light processing is one example from. And in digital light processing, what you do is you have a UV light source, which you shine on a digital mirror device. And this digital mirror device consists of all tiny mirrors, which all represent one pixel. Um, as you can see here in the movie, one pixel allowing to make a 2D drawing inside a resin container on a build platform. So as you can see in the movie, often you have a projector, which is on this digital micro mirror device, which makes these 2D drawings. And then layer by layer, your um, construct is pulled out of the resin. Now I have to note that uh, in the past, often this was done with projection and, and uh, digital micro mirror devices. But nowadays, more and more LCD displays are used um, for, as the selective photo mask. And there is also a variant on this technology, which is stereotography, where instead of um, a UV source and an LCD screen or a micro mirror device, you scan a laser across the surface of your um, uh, resin container to irradiate one layer at a time. Of course, the benefit of DLP over stereotography is that here you can flash an entire layer in one go and thereby decrease the uh, printing time. But these resins have very specific requirements. So first of all, of course, they need to be photocross linkable because it's a light-based technology. They need to be liquid because you have a container with your resin where your build platform is, is moving slightly, uh, slowly out of. So they need to be liquid. Uh, it needs to be cell interactive and biocompatible, but also you want to have a low penetration depth of your light because if you remember from the multi-photon lithography in conventional UV light, you would have polymerization all along your beam path, which you want to avoid as this would compromise the resolution. So there has been a very interesting work uh, by Cohen Lim from uh, New Zealand in collaboration with the uh, people from uh, uh, Utrecht, where they uh, made a bioing based on polyvinyl alcohol metacrylate, metacrylate and, and gelma, uh, where, which they could process in the presence of cells. Now, as I mentioned, very important is that you have this low penetration depth, and this can be achieved by adding photo absorbers, which counteract your polymerization uh, reaction. And by doing that, you can significantly increase your resolution and get a nice reproduction, reproduction of your uh, applied design. And by doing so, they could get very complicated designs in the presence of cells. So also with expecting we're focusing on that, but I cannot say a lot about this other than you have to, uh, we will present this soon, our DLP based uh, portfolio, um, which is gonna be very interesting. So this um, covered most of the conventional biofabrication technologies. So what are the future perspectives? Well, of course, there's always continuous development into this field and a very interesting um, development, uh, recent development is the tomographic 3D printing, which can really revolutionize the field. Um, as you can see here in the research uh, done also uh, between the University of Utrecht and the uh, and, uh, University of Lausanne in Switzerland. In Switzerland. Um, they could 3D print 
the Tower of Utrecht in the press in, in a Gelma containing uh, BioInk um, within seconds. So the interesting thing about this technology, it's uh, hologram based. It's basically a reverse CT scan, um, meaning that you can uh, 3D print entire objects in one go and no longer uh, have to stick to a layer by layer um, technology, which also means that your printing time is, is, is not uh, related to the size of your construct. So in a conventional extrusion based printing, you always have to deposit line after line, meaning that uh, increasing the size of your construct will significantly increase your printing time. In digital light processing, as I mentioned, you irradiate um, an entire layer in one go. So here the printing time is only determined by the height of your structure. So increasing the size also increases the printing time. Whereas in volumetric printing, you're uh, basically limited only by the uh, size of your container. Um, and which will not influence your printing time. So this brings me to the conclusions of uh, my talk. So I hope that I've convinced you that uh, biofabrication is a very promising technology. We are getting close to overcoming the hurdles while the actual uh, regeneration or, or creation of, of donor organs uh, is still uh, far in the future, well, not that far anymore, I would say, but there's already a high new future potential in drug screening applications and uh, advancing the entire field of regenerative medicine and biomedical field. But what I hope to uh, have convinced you of is that to obtain all these uh, breakthroughs, and actually the key is in the bio wings. But of course, there's, there's uh, innov innovations on all the levels, but it all starts with the materials which determine the material properties. So with that, uh, I would like to end my presentation. And if you have any questions, I'm uh, willing to take them. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Jasper. So as you mentioned, we are indeed going to see if there are some questions. Um, so, <clears throat> Uh, someone asked, I was a bit confused about the, uh, the term thermoplastic hydrogels. Um, it it uh, concerns one of your first slides. So mm -hmm. did you mean uh, some kind of blend of uh, PC PCL and gelma, or what did you mean with the thermoplastic hydrogel? Uh, no, actually we, we have a, a material platform which allows us to, um, to have polymers, hydrogel polymers, which can be processed from the melt, like a conventional thermoplast, um, and then afterwards cross-linked uh, in the solid state. So you can have your polymer, a hydrophilic polymer, like uh, similar as, as you would have a PVA in conventional 3D printing, uh, which you can process as a, as a thermoplast, then cross-link in the solid state, put in, in water or in, in medium, and this will swell into a, a hydrogel, making this a, a unique uh, material portfolio. Okay, um, the next question, um, does in-situ cross-linking require a specialized printer or some uh, different arrangements? Uh, yeah, so in-situ in, in cross-linking is, uh, to the best of my knowledge, not available commercially yet. Um, but what, uh, what you basically first of all need is a UV transparent nozzle or needle. Um, so that's uh, the first thing. And then you need to, of course, have a UV source on UV or, or uh, near UV um, light source, which is focused on this needle. But I know in the in the research group of, of, of Jason Burdick, where they came up with this technology, they actually modified a conventional 3D printer, just put a light on there and uh, attach a um, transparent nozzle to uh, end up with these uh, processing capabilities. Okay, that's uh, clear. Then the next one, is there a high chance of rejection by the human cells if you use 3D printed tissue, for example? Well, it all depends on, on what material you're using. So you can, you can prevent this in, in, in many ways. Um, so normally you wouldn't expect tissue rejection if you use uh, patient's own cells. So you could harvest stem cells from, from the patient itself, stem cells or, or, or specific tissue cells, depending on what you're aiming to regenerate. So in that sense, 
these cells will not be foreign to the body. So you will not get the, the same immune system responses as you would get with conventional um, donor tissue from, from other uh, patients. Uh, but the second aspect is, of course, the material your bioink is made of. Um, so preferably, you want to use materials which are which don't induce a foreign body response. Um, and in in this sense, for example, uh, Rousselot is, is currently working on on um, gelatins which have a low endotoxin content, um, because uh, often. It's not the gelatin itself. If you use a gelatin-based material, it's not the gelatin itself which will elicit this, this foreign body response or immune system response, but it's actually endotoxins which is are which are in there, uh, which are very difficult to get rid of. But therefore, the gelatin suppliers such as Rousselo have come up with a low endotoxin um, derivative, which can form the basis of a of a bioink, uh, which avoids all these issues. Yeah. Okay. Um, the next one is um, so why in multi uh, why is that, why is that in multiphoton inks needs to be solid but DLP it's a liquid because this is uh, based on the unique principle of uh, of multiphoton lithography so um, this all relates well basically I can I can see, show it here as well so the thing is in in multiphoton lithography you only have polymerization this very small voxel. Um, which is only occurring at the focal plane of your objective to which you are uh, shining your laser. So therefore, by moving your objective up and down, you can move this focal plane through your material. And by moving your, your construct, um, well, it's, it's mostly the, the laser beam which is, mirror, which is uh, moved. Actually, you can move this, this dot in three dimensions all the way through your construct. So in that sense, um, if you have a solid material, you can still print in all three dimensions. Whereas with the DLP technology, you have a liquid resin container. So what you basically have is this is your, your print plate, which goes at the beginning of the print all the way down to the bottom. And you irradiate your first layer and then it moves upwards to irradiate the, the second layer. And therefore your resin container needs to be liquid because here you only have polymerization at the interface of your uh, resin with the outside world. Um, and therefore you need to have it uh, liquid as you need to be able to move your construct and your, your printed structure out of your um, resin bath. Okay. Um, the next question, if you use bio inks to print um, arteries, for example, how long will they exist in the human body and do they need to be replaced after a while or how does? Well, this is a bit the, the, the goal or, or the concept of, of, of biofabrication. So the idea is that if you have your arteries, uh, like, like here, for example, if you have your arteries 3D printed in your material, the idea is, uh, it's not shown in this picture, but uh, my colleague also mentioned to line them, manage to line them with uh, endothelial cells, for example. So the idea is that by combining the multiple cell types is that your, your cells will start to secrete their own extracellular matrix. So basically what, what you, you do with them by placing your cells in the right positions and giving them the right cues, they will form their own arteries. So your biomaterial will degrade. So your bio ink will degrade over time, but it will be substituted by a natural extracellular matrix or by a natural newly regenerated artery. So in that sense, the idea is, or the goal is that it, it's not different from, from a natural artery anymore. So that it just regrows. Okay. Um, the next question, is it possible to use some kind of support structure to print thermoplastics like PCL? Um, yeah, you can always use support structures. So this is, this is, um, this is one of the, the um, things which is also done in, in conventional 3D printing. So um, you can have a support structure which is sacrificial or you can have a support structure which is permanent depending on, on what you're, you're aiming for uh, by combining multiple materials with uh, multiple technologies. But for example, in, in the conventional 
3D printing field, like the, the hobby 3D printing field, PVA is often used as a support structure for thermoplastics to make more complicated architectures. And then by immersing a structure in water, the PVA will dissolve, but uh, the thermoplast is not water soluble and will remain. Yeah, then we also have a question from a certain Bob. So um, when the cells are encapsulated in the scaffold, how is the scaffold afterwards transferred into the patient? Well, so the idea is that you, well, it all depends on, on the, the size, but the idea is that over time you would, um, you would form your tissue in a bioreactor until it's mature enough. And then you would just use this, the same te techniques as, as currently is used in, in donor transplantation to put the, uh, the generated tissue into the patient. So if you have, for example, arteries in there or, or, or yeah, capillaries or, or whatever, it's also important that uh, as with conventional transplantations that you attach these to the existing blood vessels. Um, but normally, um, there have been some, some in vivo studies where you have, where they are just uh, sewn in. Then um, we also have a question. Um, I think it may be a bit um, the same as already showed up. So do you know anything about the tox uh, toxicological effects of uh, bio inks? And when could something like that be applicable? Yeah, so the... That's a bit uh, the benefit of, of, of now that this field is emerging is, is, is transferring outside from the acad academic field. So of course you always aim to use biocompatible materials, but yeah, biocompatibility um, is always uh, relative. If you ever want to bring this to, uh, to a patient, you of course need also to complete regulatory approval. Um, so in this sense, you already start from, from uh, biocompatible materials, but by standardizing everything, by taking this outside of the, the research field and then to the commercial field, this also opens the road for uh, large-scale toxicity testing. Uh, so in, in, in this respect, uh, by having this transfer to the to real world, how I sometimes refer to it, um, this also opens the road to start up with the regulatory aspect, because this has always been a thing which had been has been a bit lagging behind. It's without every new technology, of course, the, the regulatory framework is not ready for that. But we see, we see that there's, um, that uh, in Europe and in America, they are starting to uh, really adapt to these new types of, of regenerative medicine and, and create a regulatory framework so that these uh, concepts, if they're not toxic, can also go to the patients at one point. Um, then, a question, why can PLA not be functionalized to make it uh, photo cross linkable? Yeah, it can be functionalized and uh, there have been examples um, in literature. Um, um, yeah, I just didn't include it in the presentation because um, yeah, the, the benefit is then you could use it for, uh, for, for, for resins. Um, but it, it, there is no, as far as I know, no commercial uh, photocross linkable PLA uh, existent to date. Um, and usually still PCL is, is, is preferred over PLA because PLA is a very brittle material, which is often not, not um, ideal. But you can, of course, make a PLA uh, photocross linkable in the same method that you can uh, make PCL photocross linkable by, for example, uh, attaching acrylates to the to the end groups. Okay, um, and are there, are there um, actually already um, examples of hydrogels used of, or that reached the market for uh, tissue engineering? And if not, how far are we away from that, you think? So it, it all depends a bit on, on what you understand under, under tissue engineering, but there are already hydrogels, for example, based on hyaluronic acid, uh, which are used as uh, tissue fillers. So that's injectables, it's not 3D printing. But there are already some materials uh, which have made it to the patient. Um, but we're, in my opinion, we're not far off anymore because also this is all always related to the interest of, of, of the industry and the, and, and the money which is associated with it. 
as long as, as, as these technologies are existing only in academic fields, nobody is going to put in the effort to, to go through the very expensive trajectory to make it approved for, for uh, human use. But of course, now that this whole concept is, is starting to move outside of the academic field uh, towards the commercial field and, and the first applications, the first companies are appearing with uh, which promise that they will have 3D printed uh, tissues in, in the coming four to five years. I'm still a bit skeptical about that, but at least it shows that there is an interest from the industry, from the industry and from the market and that people are starting to take these efforts to take these materials um, from research towards application. Okay. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think we're um, almost through all questions. So if there are still questions, they can always contact you, um, I guess. Yes, I, uh, yeah, you can always uh, send me an email. I didn't show the slide, but I have my, you can always go to the website or send an email or you can send an email to me personally, then it's instead of info at expectings and it's Jasper van Hoerik at expectings.com. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, so yeah, thank you very much, Jasper, for your interesting uh, talk and nice explanation of the biomaterials and nice example of the bioprinting applications. It's uh, really inspiring to see how fast this field is growing, and, and I'm really looking forward um, when the first application will reach the market. So um, I wish everything, every one of you, a good evening. Uh, thanks for joining this webinar, and hope to see you soon. Bye. All right. Thanks. Bye.